So we, we have been talking about the transition from the pre-modern world into modernity. Uh, we have spoken about the postmodern critique of the modern era. And now we might possibly transitioning into a new uh, era. And if we are able to have a breakthrough rather than a breakdown, we might be talking about this new age as a age of regeneration or talk about the logic of life or the age of freedom. Um, the word uh, I prefer to use is to talk about a metamodern age. So after the pre-modern world, we had modernity, the modern world, the postmodern critique of the modern world, and hopefully the birth of a metamodern civilization. Uh, if you're interested in reading more ab about a possible third attractor in the form of a metamodern civilization, I recommend my friend and colleague Lena Anderson's small book, uh, Metamodernity. Um, a shorter version of that is uh, uh, available uh, for download free on online. Uh, and also I recommend uh, the anthology uh, that's called The Dispatches from a Time Between Worlds, Crisis and Emergence in Metamodernity, by, edited by Jonathan Rousen and Lehman uh, Pascal. Uh, Jonathan Rousen's preface in this book is also available for, down, for download at the Perspectiva uh, website. And that is a quite difficult um, but very uh, good and thorough introduction to uh, uh, metamodernity and metamodern uh, philosophy. So then uh, moving on to uh, deep psychology and uh, uh, then going back to our social imaginary and our way of uh, constructing our uh, culture and reality and to understand what's really going on there on a deep psychological level, we might need to understand concepts like uh, psychological archetypes, our collective unconscious and things like that. But what I would want to focus on now is more uh, the aspect of uh, adult developmental psychology. The, the contemporary psychological understanding of the way that we can evolve our minds throughout our lifetime and what personal inner development uh, actually means from a psychological perspective. So uh, um, in order to talk about inner transformation from a psychological perspective, um, one term that is uh, uh, useful is to talk about vertical development and to separate vertical development from horizontal learning so or horizontal development. So when, when we usually talk about uh, uh, learning throughout life. We are talking about learning skills and, and facts. We, early in life, we learn to walk, uh, talk, read, and do things like that. Later on at school, we learn algebra, we learn civics, we might learn how to cook and drive a car. Uh, later on, we, as adults, we learn a trade, we learn how to function as citizens in, in, in society with all of that aspect. And then further on in life, we might reschool, we might acquire specialist skills, we might study some new subjects as a hobby. And all of this is good, and it's all the, vert uh, the horizontal development, and we, we need that. And more and more, we are focusing now on in a society with rapid technological change, that lifelong learning, lifelong horizontal development is necessary. 
But what we are often forget forgetting in today's society is the more vertical aspect of our development. And that is not around not so much the content of our mind, um, uh, but more uh, the, the possibility for our mind to be able to handle more and more complex aspects of our world. So it's a complexification of our mind. It's also a development of ju not just our mind, but also our uh, emotions. So it's both cognitive development and emotional uh, development. And that could entail things like, as a child, to be able to postpone uh, need satisfaction, to be able to care for others, to understand others' inner worlds, to seek multiple perspectives on, on questions, to be able, as we said before, to take a perspective on one's culture, to be able to see the water that we are swimming in. Uh, that, that is not easy, and that involves uh, development in this vertical dimension. And capturing this lifelong vertical development that we might call a, uh, a development along a maturation dimension or a wisdom dimension uh, has been the subject of psychological studies for, 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 for many years. And uh, uh, one way of looking at this is to say that this vertical development is really a question of expanding your mind, adding more and more layers to the capacity of your mind, and that this can happen in many different dimensions. So you are talking about an expansion of mind into the into different layers of complexity awareness, contextual awareness, perspectival awareness, self-insight, relational awareness, and into different dimensions of compassion and, and, and empathy. And in some simpler models, you can talk about us as humans going through a number of stages in our uh, uh, in the development of our mind, going from uh, an instrumental way of knowing and being in the world that we developed during childhood to during adolescence, develop out of that instrumental mind into a socialized mind. And then later on in life, being able to transition from the socialized mind into what some uh, uh, developmental psychologists call a self-authoring mind. And then some people are even able to later in life to develop a self-transforming way of being in society. And you could say that living in different societies with different complexity demands uh, different capacities, different complexities of your mind. So whereas in the pre-modern society, it was actually enough to be functioning there to have a socialized mind. You could even say that it was preferred to be in a socialized mind. You were expected to be in a socialized mind in a pre-modern society. And being in a socialized mind, meaning that you are very much dependent on an outside authority, on your culture and on your peers, and on, on an outside uh, source for guidance of your values and, and your thinking in that world. Whereas in modernity, we are encouraged and also expected to be functioning uh, more in a self-authoring way, where we are much more in a deeper sense, actually authors of our own uh, lives. 
But that is a developmental step that not everyone in our society today takes. And, and that is why perhaps so many of us today feel that we are in over our heads of complexity. And as society becomes more and more complex, even more demands on our inner uh, resources are, are made. So this is one way of looking at uh, the inner demands that society is putting on us and how we can uh, evolve. Um, another way uh, to do this is to take the perspective of the In the Development Goals uh, project that my foundation has been one of the initiators uh, of. And that is really coming from a completely different point of view, not so much the, the psychological, theoretical uh, modeling of our minds and its development, but rather from a practical point of view, asking the, the question, how does it come that we, many of us in society today, feel so completely overwhelmed by the challenges that we are facing today, our existential challenges? And how come uh, that we are not doing more to, to reach the SDGs? So we asked the question, what capabilities, qualities, or skills do you believe are essential to develop individually and collectively, importantly, individually and collectively, in order to get us significantly closer to fulfilling the sustainable development goals. And we asked this question to more than a thousand people, uh, different experts, could be psychologists, could be people working with HR, could be people working with sustainability. Um, and we got uh, more than a thousand answers and we were in a deep dialogue with quite a lot of these thousands of people. And then a group of international experts on inner development and psychology looked at all of these answers and out of that came the framework of the inner development goals the transformational skills that we need for sustainable development and uh, this program uh, is supported by uh, a lot of academic uh, partners drawing on expertise from many parts of the world today many more than the ones I show on this slide. And also we have a lot of supporting partners from uh, different international corporations, which clearly can see in their organizations the need to help many of their employees to be able to both emotionally and cognitively uh, develop capacities to handle a much more rapidly moving and much more complex business uh, reality. And we are happy to say that at the beginning uh, of uh, 2022, Costa Rica became the first nation to adopt the IDGs as a national framework for inner development and growth. So what is this framework? Well, it is a framework of 23 specific skills or capacities that we can develop and that we believe are essential that we develop in order for us to be able to tackle the global challenges that we are facing right now. And these 23 skills are divided into five different groups or dimensions. So the first dimension is all about the relationship to self. And we call that dimension being. The second dimension are the con cognitive skills. And we call that dimension thinking. Then we have the dimension of caring for others and the world, relating. The social skills, 
collaborating and driving change in the world, acting. And uh, I will not go through all the different uh, skills and capacities. You can look that up if you are interested on the in the development goals.com website. But I can just mention a few. So in being, it's a lot about self-awareness and presence. In thinking, we could have perspective skills and long-term orientation and visioning. Relating, humility, empathy and compassion. Collaborating, trust and co-creation skills. And in acting, courage and perseverance. And the interesting thing and the good news with all these different skills and capacities uh, is that science clearly show that they can all be developed throughout our life. So for example, if we look at the empathy and com compassion so we are not, of, of course, not born with a certain amount of empathy or compassion. No, science shows clearly that we can both extend our compassion to include more and more circles of belongings, more and more parts of humanity, and perhaps even future generations, and perhaps even all sentient beings. So yes, science shows that we can extend empathy and compassion and that that is something that we can work on during our whole lives. That's the good news. The bad news is that you cannot teach almost any of these skills and capacities and certainly not empathy and compassion in a normal school setting. So to develop these uh, skills and capacities, you need different forms of learning. Uh, some experts are talking uh, about transformative learning or immersive learning that involves deeper psychological processes. And that is learning that takes uh, uh, a lot of, of time. But again, it is possible. And the interesting thing when it comes to developing these capacities is that even if as a starting point, the inner development goals have had a very much attraction on the corporate level, because in organizations, the, the need to help employees to uh, tackle the complexity of the world is just so acute. So many organizations are actively now starting to help employees developing these skills and capacities, whether they are using the IDD framework or, 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 or not. But the interesting thing is that these skills, uh, even if you perhaps acquire them for an instrumental reason within an organization, it is exactly the same skills that you need on an individual level to function better in uh, a family and manage your own life. And at the same time, uh, it's also the skills that we need in society in order for us to be able to preserve and even deepen uh, our democracy and to become active and co-creating citizens in society. And, of course, again, uh, these are the, are the same capacities and skills that we need in, in order for us all to be able to, com to contribute to a more sustainable planet. So with the IDGs, all these levels are uh, um, aligned. And if you develop capacities for one of these levels, you will get uh, the other levels at the same time, so to say. Okay, so then the next question is done. 
So if you can't learn these skills in a normal school setting, how do you do, how do you go about developing these skills? So uh, to answer that question, uh, the IDG project is developing an IDG toolkit where we have collected from uh, psychologists, researchers, and practitioners different methods that have proven um, uh, have been proved to work to develop these skills. So this catalog of uh, processes and tools uh, is available uh, online and is divided between the different dimensions and describe different methods and methodologies that can be used for developing these uh, skills and dimensions. Uh, and uh, again, the toolkit is available online and is uh, constantly being updated with new uh, methods and uh, resources. Another way of, of looking at these skills and resources is to uh, look upon them as psychological uh, resources that you need in order to function and flourish and to contribute in this world. So all the different IDG skills are building these psychological resources that we need. And you could say that for a person in a given situation, there is a certain level of psychological resources that that person needs just in order to, to manage uh, and cope uh, with everyday life. And if you haven't got enough psychological resources to do that, then you, you feel stress and you are suffering. And uh, in the language of the adult developmental psychologist, Professor Robert Keegan, many of us feel today in society that we are in over our heads. We, we are just about coping with the complexity, emotional and cognitive complexity of everyday life. Um, if we have even less resources or, or the, the demands on us are increasing even more, we may face a breakdown of psychological functioning. Uh, and then we are talking about clinical mental health issues. But of course, uh, it, it is not enough for us in life to be managing and coping with everyday life. We want to develop these inner skills and resources to such an extent that we can actually flourish in a complex world. And if we develop even more resources, we can come to a point where we can free up mental energy from our own individual position and just managing our own life and family and flourishing ourselves and helping our family flourish, but really have the capacity to look beyond and to start looking at the possibility to contribute to a better world. And when you do this, you can do this, you can do this, you can work on these, building these psychological resources in an, organ in an organization, as we said. You could do this by individual programs like coaching or, or a therapy or developmental retreats. But we have also been looking to see if it is possible to uh, democratize and make accessible tools for psychological growth by using a digital platform and by that spreading the possibility for inner growth to millions of people. Uh, and that was the starting point for the nonprofit open source project of 29K, which is really looking at creating a, a digital platform, uh, not for clinical mental health issues, but starting above that 
and really helping people to both manage and cope with everyday life, help them flourish, and also develop capacity to contribute to a, a better world. And um, 29K is, as I said, a nonprofit digital platform for inner growth. 29K, that is 29,000. That's the number of days you have in your life if you live a, a long life. And our tagline is make them all matter. And uh, you can download the 29K app from uh, Google Play or Apple App Store. And uh, you will find different programs uh, and exercises there. But the real central function within this platform is really the uh, video sharing function where we create small um, trust, trustful environments where the users can share their growth experience and their challenges with other people on uh, the platform. And one idea with the platform is that as um, that it will also be a research platform for which interventions are working best in supporting which individuals at what stage in your, your life. And uh, a dream would be to have the possibility that when a lot of users, when thousands of users are on the platform learning and growing, then the platform is using, using research and machine learning to in itself learn and grow and become better and better at suggesting different exercises and interventions to different users. Okay, so um, talking about the need for inner growth and development and talking about the fact that we need to be able to find different ways to really scale um, the access to inner growth and development um, tools to many, many people in society. Uh, that can sound a bit like um, an unrealistic dream, a dream project. And of course, in some ways, it is. Uh, but it's also important to say that we have some historical examples where a really broad scale effort to help a lot of people develop inner capacities and resources uh, has actually taken place. And I would want to do uh, end uh, today by uh, talking about uh, a case study, which was which is about the transition for the Nordic countries from pre-modern world into modernity. And my friend and colleague Lena Anderson from from Denmark uh, and I uh, are uh, developing and investigating this case study in, in our book, uh, The Nordic Secret. And um, uh, I should start by pointing you to the cover of the book and you see a, a woman there with a number sign. Uh, and I would want you to see if you recognize that woman. And I will come back to her uh, at the end of uh, the presentation. So what is this black woman with a number tag doing on the cover of the Nordic Secret? And who is she? So what is the Nordic Secret about? It is about the, the previous paradigm shift again, when we went from an 
me medieval pre-modern world into modernity. And that is a transition that came relatively late to the Scandinavian countries. Uh, it is also the story about uh, helping a lot of people to take this very important psychological step that we were talking about before, uh, going from a socialized uh, mind, uh, where you are very much uh, dependent on external authority, to connecting with your inner compass and becoming more self-authoring. And first I should say that, of course, it's very easy to forget that all the uh, Nordic countries uh, 150 years ago were really poor countries. They were amongst the poorest non-democratic agrarian societies in Europe. Uh, they were even that poor that during the last decades of the 1800s, huge uh, amounts of people were emigrating. So from Sweden, about 30% of the working population emigrated, mainly to the US due to such bad uh, living conditions in, in Sweden. And then just a few generations later, even before the Second World War, uh, all the Nordic countries were among the happiest, the richest, the most stable industrial democracies in the world. And uh, one can ask the question, what's so special about these countries and what happened back then in order for us to have made this rapid and successful transition into a completely new world. And of course, it, it has got many reasons, but one forgotten reason, and uh, Lena and I argue that it might have been the most important reason, was that back then, at the end of the 1800s, we had in all the Scandinavian countries, very visionary intellectuals and politicians who knew that in times of rapid societal change, and of course they saw industrialization and urbanization and all of that coming, in those times of rapid societal change, it's just so easy for us humans to want to have an external authority to hold on to. A dogmatic religion, or an Erdogan or, or a Trump. But these politicians and intellectuals, they didn't want to be authoritarian leaders. They were firmly committed to build democracy. And they knew that the only way to build democracy is to build it from bottom up. So they wanted to uh, help a substantial part of the population to take this important developmental step from being out and directed to connecting with your own inner compass, become inner directed, and by that being able to find your own way through complexity, through chaos, and actually become conscious co-creators of the new society that wanted to be born. And the way they went about to do that was actually extraordinary. What they did was that they created uh, development centers, retreat centers, you could even call them, because they were often out in nature. And this started in Denmark in the 1860s with a few centers. And this quickly spread to Norway and then to Sweden. And the number of centers grow rapidly. So by the turn of the last century, year 1900, there were 100 centers just in Denmark, 75 in Norway, and 150 centers in Sweden. 
where young adults in their 20s, later on with full state subsidy, could spend up to six months in retreat with the expressed aim of developing your inner capacities for the benefit of society. And when this program was at its height, almost exactly a hundred years ago, then 10% of each new generation, 10% of each new generation had the opportunity to participate in uh, one of these six months uh, retreats. Uh, and of course, that created what we today would call uh, a critical mass. And we can still today in the Nordic society see the benefits of, of these programs. And th this is what a center like this could have looked like uh, at the end of the 1800s. This is a typical building, was relatively small, holding 20, 40, 60 uh, people living together, living together with their teachers or facilitators and being in, in daily um, interaction. Uh, they would learn sk skills and things that were horizontal learning taking place there. And there were vertic vertic focus on the vertical development, on developing these skills and capacities. And you could ask, what, what was then actually happening there? Well, a bit, little bit simplified, you can say that uh, apart from learning new things, they were working on the these aspects of the participants. They were de developing their relationship to themselves, the cognitive skills, the, the relationship to others and the world, social skills, but also interestingly, uh, driving change, really giving both the skills, but also techniques and tools to become active citizens in, in society, how to create a small NGO, how to start a small newspaper, how to argue for your courses and, and things like uh, uh, that. Uh, the inspiration for this came actually from Germany. Now here we have the German philosophers Schiller and Goethe. And Schiller and Goethe and the other idealist philosophers such as Herder, von Humboldt, Hegel, they all wrote in the beginning of the 1800s and they reacted against the Enlightenment philosophers' view of our mind as a rational machine. Uh, no, they said, no, we are not homo economicus. We are not these rational people. Our mind is not just a machine. Our mind is an organic system under lifelong evolution. And this evolution is very much taking place in relationship to the culture around us and the cultural evolution. So if you want to evolve society, you need to help people with their inner development. And uh, these ideas uh, were applied on the university level in Germany. So one of these um, uh, Bildung, as this tradition is called in, in Germany, one of these Bildung philosophers, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, he became the Minister of Education in Prussia and he founded the Humboldt University in Berlin. But this concept of Bildung was never given to the German people. Whereas in Scandinavia, we took this concept and we turned it into Volksbildung, Bildung for the general public, consciousness development for the many, development of the inner capacities for the many in society. Uh, and that brings me uh, back to 
uh, where I started talking about this case study. And, and as you understand now, I see this not the story about the Scandinavian countries, not as a blueprint for what we need today, do today, but I see it as a very strong case study that uh, focusing on large scale capacity building in societies has actually proven to have a long lasting effect. And especially in times of rapid societal transition, it becomes very, very important that we in those societies have a lot of people who have the inner capacities to become conscious and active co-creators to be able from a more bottom-up perspective, be agents for the new civilization that wants to be born. Finishing on, on this um, uh, black American woman, this is actually Rosa Parks, uh, the black woman uh, who in Alabama in the 50s refused to give up her seat on the bus to that white guy, even though she knew that the land, law of the land said that she had to give up the seat. She has in many uh, interviews said that what gave her the courage and the inner strength and connection with her own inner moral compass to know that she had the moral right to remain seated was the fact that she had participated in one of these Scandinavian retreats. Not in Scandinavia, but in the US. Because in the 20s, there was an American called Miles Horton who spent a year in Denmark learning this concept and then went back to the US and started four folk high schools in America, in the US. And uh, the most famous of those ones are the Highlander Folk School in Tennessee. And Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and the many, many people from the civil rights movement actually got their inner compass and their inner strength and training from these centers. And as an anecdote, you can even on YouTube find, if you Google, uh, a speech given by President Obama in the last uh, months of his presidency when he had the four uh, heads of states from uh, the Scandinavian countries, from the Nordic countries, on state visit. Uh, at the final dinner, he said that you Scandinavian countries, you have given so many wonderful gifts uh, to the uh, to the to to humanity and i don't remember exactly what he he said that but he might have been talking about the nobel prize or volvo or ikea or or something like that but he said a, a very much under uh, appreciated gift to the world has been the concept of the folk high schools and how this concept traveled to the us and he said if it hadn't been for the Folk High School and the concept that was brought to the US and to the inner development that that created, I would not be standing here in front of you as the first black American president. And I think that is just so strong and showing that inner development is a prerequisite for outer transformation. Thank you so much.